I've been singing a song all morning. It's a song that played in my friend's house, the Bellamy household, when I was growing up in San Diego. Mr. Bellamy, who was one of my great mentors and, and father figures in my life uh, from um, a time when I really needed strong and, and thoughtful and gracious and, and funny father figures. He was a big fan of gospel. And before I go any further, I really want to encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to go to the Hillcrest Cinema sometime this week and watch the Aretha Franklin gospel documentary of her recording the album Amazing Grace in the church in Los Angeles. It is so amazing, and it will open your heart and feel and touch your spirit. And if you've never experienced black church, it is a wonderful opportunity to have black church right there at the Hillcrest Cinema because half the congregation or people gathered in the movie theater will be black, and they will clap and dance and shout at the screen. It's so much fun. But all morning, I have been singing this song, and it goes something like this. Lord, I don't know. I don't know just how we made it over. Lord, I don't know. It must have been the grace of God. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I've already come the grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home Lord I don't know I don't know just how we made it over. Lord, I don't know. It must have been the grace of God. I'm not going to be long. Not this morning. The hooping and hollering for, for last week. In my Colonel Sanders suit, my pink tie. No, this morning is about consoling. That song was recorded by the consolers of a wonderful gospel duo. And I heard it so many times at the Bellamy household. And this morning I need consoling. I think many of us do as well. I'm tired. And I'm weary. I'm so tired and weary of coming to church on Sunday morning after shooting at a house of prayer, a house of worship, a place of God. Yesterday, as I was putting my suitcase in the trunk of my parents' car, about to be driven to Love Field to fly back to San Diego after a week of taking care of my dad following his surgery, which let me just pause for a moment and say for those of you who are caretakers, God bless you and serve you. May God lift you up and protect you. Because I had to do it for six confined days, and it was not as bad as I thought it would be those of you who have open-ended caretaking responsibilities for your loved ones and your family and your friends, God bless you, God speed. Thank you for what you do. It is sacred work. But as I was putting my suitcase in my parents' car, my dad was seated in his recliner and um, he shouts from the bin into the garage where I'm standing by the car, and he says, there has been a shooting in a synagogue in San Diego. 
And for the next 45 minutes, because I'm driving, because my parents' health is so that they cannot drive, so bless them, they drove back to their house. Oh, I was saying prayers for them. Oh, my goodness. He doesn't give me any more information. It takes me another 45 minutes to get through the terminal and the security to sit down at my gate so I can actually open my phone and look to see that the shooting took place at, in Poway at Shabbat Synagogue and not at Temple Emmanuel off of Del Cerro where my friend, such a great friend, Rabbi Devorah Marcus, and so many people who live in the greater Kensington and Talmadge area actually go for Shabbat services every Friday evening. I was somewhat relieved that it wasn't my friend's synagogue, that it wasn't my friend's congregation, that it wasn't my neighbors in this community, though my heart still broke openly for the people of Poway and the people at Shabbat Synagogue. And then last night, as I'm staring at the ceiling because my body's all out of whack from the traveling and the, and the time change and from my heart just being ripped, just ripped apart by the shooting, I'm staring at the ceiling and I remember that my therapist attends that synagogue. She's the daughter of a rabbi, an Orthodox rabbi, that moved from Brooklyn, New York, to California to pursue her career in psychology. And when she and her husband decided to start a family and, and have children, they decided to go back to their Orthodox roots, and they, ch they joined Shabbat Synagogue in Poway because that synagogue's purpose is to get people who want to have an Orthodox Jewish experience to do so in a modern context. And I could not help but think that she was there, that her husband was there, that her daughter, her two-year-old daughter was there. I cannot help it, sisters and brothers, that when I read or hear a story of a shooting of a violent act of terror that happens at a place of worship, a house of God, I cannot help but think of you. And what would happen if it happened here? And this happened to you. I cannot help but think that when, when you say, rest in peace, Lori Kane, for running your race, who died at 60 years old from a random act of violence and terror, that I cannot help but think of our AARP senior citizen crowd here at Kensington and how heartbroken I would be if something happened to you. I cannot help but think of all the grandmothers and grandfathers in this congregation who jumped and shielded an eight-year-old daughter and child from, and protected her from the bullets that were being sprayed through the sanctuary space. And think of how many of you would courageously and bravely jump in front of a child or any other person in our midst to protect them and to shield them from the terror. I cannot help but think that when Noah Dom, eight years old, was shot in the arm, that I can't think of the 40 children that were sitting in front of me just now and how heartbroken I would be if something happened to them. I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm done coming to church on Sunday morning and having to do this again and again and again, and yet here we are. And so how are we going to get over? I have to trust and believe that it will be by the grace of God. Because if anything, the situation that happened in Poway just yesterday proved that the solutions and the rhetoric on both sides of the aisle proved that they are false. The solutions from the left and the right are fallacies, a pox on both of their houses. Where the left says we need stricter gun laws, there are no stricter gun laws than the laws that, find, that we find here in, in San Diego and California. The right says we need an armed presence, an open carry as a deterrent. There was an open carry and a handgun, and an armed presence in the sanctuary yesterday. The solution is not political. The solution is a spiritual revolution of grace, compassion, 
kindness and mercy. The solution is saying the name of the shooter, John Ernest. He was 19 years old and praying for him as he prayed for Lori Kane. And God shepherded her to the green meadows that sit beside still waters of paradise where God gathers all of those who have gone before us. Many people have been asking the question in the last 24 hours, where was God in all of this? As Christians of Easter tide of the rid that we worship, the risen Christ in our midst, our answer to that question was right there. Comforting Lori as she breathed her last, wiping the tears of young, of young Noah as she cried. God is sitting next to John Ernest in the county jail right now, whispering in his ear, tugging on his heart to repent from the twisted and evil ideology that sees Jews and Muslims, gays, and African Americans, immigrants, and people who are different from him as evil and wrong who need to be terminated and exterminated. God is working on him right now to turn his heart around. I believe that. I believe that God is with us in our tiredness and our weariness. And that the way we get over this is by walking the way, the truth, and the life of the risen Christ. Who shows us the way through Good Friday into an Easter morn on a dawn when joy reigns again. Have you noticed that when Christ appeared to the disciples, he wasn't perfect. He had scars and wounds. Good Friday had taken a toll on him, just like it takes a toll on us. But our charge this day, as we walk in the way of the living Christ, is to do so on that great getting up morning where I danced around like a monkey last week, hooping and hollering. The same words apply today in our tiredness and our weariness. That it's our great getting up morning. So let us get up and walk the ways of kindness and mercy, compassion, and grace. So that there can be a spiritual revolution because the political answers won't solve this problem for us. Only those of us standing with courage and faith in a new dawn to come can work this revolution into a reality. The great Jewish poet, Philip Larkin, has a poem called The Mower. It's a sad poem. Melancholy, really. It's about a farmer who, while the wheat grows tall, a hedgehog makes a home in the field, and as the, mower, and as the farmer goes to reap his harvest, he accidentally runs over the hedgehog with his mower, with his tractor, and he feels incredibly sad at the loss of his innocent life, just as we feel sad at the loss of innocent life. The ending line couplet of that poem is words that have always have stood with me, that speak to me to this day. Life comes to an end. Some of us are graced with many years while others leave us way too soon. But we all have a choice in how we're going to live the life that we are given. And at the end of the mower, Philip Larkin calls to us, saying we ought to be aware of each other. We ought to be kind. 
while there is still time. That is what the risen Christ is calling us to see this day. Piling on kindness, on top of kindness, on top of kindness, on top of kindness. Praying for the loss of their families and people. Praying for John and Ernest. Loving our enemies as we love our neighbors. We love ourselves. And we love God. This is not an easy task. We will be wounded. But it is the way to Easter, to resurrection, to a new day. And until it comes, let us walk faithfully with our risen Christ through Good Friday and Easter days. That's the good news.